Mr. Willie O'Ree, welcome to The Daily Show. Thank you very much. It certainly is a pleasure to be here. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. I mean, I'm talking to uh, a man who's a legend on so many counts. I mean, you, you, you're, you're a legend because of what you did for the sport of hockey. Uh, you're a legend because you were the first black player in the NHL. And for me, you are a legend because you are a black person who chose to play on the ice. I, I don't meet many black people who willingly go to the cold, Mr. O'Ree. So uh, you're, a re you're a legend personally for me <laughs> as an African. Welcome to the show. It's good to have you. Thank you, sir. Um, let's talk a little bit about your journey. You know, it, it, it wasn't anything that anybody had done before. You, you know, you talk about this in your life and how uh, you had a dream. You said, I want to play in the NHL. I want to be a professional hockey player. Nobody had done it. Nobody thought anybody could do it. And yet you set your mind to it. I'd love to know how you, you had this idea of doing something that had never been done before with the clarity that you had. Well, when I was 14 years of age, I decided I wanted to become a professional hockey player and then hopefully one day in the, uh, play in the National Hockey League. And uh, I have to give credit to my older brother, who was not only my brother and my friend, but he was my mentor. And he taught me a lot of things that I would need to know. So I started playing organized hockey. Uh, and at 14, I uh, left my hometown to go up to uh, Quebec, Canada to play junior, junior hockey with the um, Quebec Frontenacs. Uh, played there that uh, one year, and then I went and played uh, in Kitchener, Ontario, the second year, and that's when I had uh, an unfortunate accident. You know, none of the players wore any helmets, no face shields, no cages, and um, I was struck in the right eye with a puck and lost 97% vision in my right eye. And wow. The, doc the doctor told me I'd never play hockey again, but uh, I kept it a secret and um, tur turned pro in 1956 and was able to play 21 years with one eye. Wait, 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 wait. Let's, okay, now we, now we need to add an extra layer of legend to the story. You lost some of your vision and the doctor said that you were legally blind. You keep this a secret and then you go on to play. I, I, don't, I don't even understand how that's possible. I can't follow the puck. I've been to hockey games. I love watching hockey games, but it's like, I can't follow the puck. But you're telling me you were a professional player who was legally blind. I don't understand how you did this. Well, you know, um... <clears throat> I, when I went to the hospital and um, I was in my recovery room and the doctor said, Mr. O'Ree says, you're going to be blind and you'll never play hockey again. Well, the two goals that I had set for myself, well, seemingly were gone. But I got out of the hospital and um, within the next five uh, weeks, I'm back on the ice uh, practicing and playing. Now, I'm a left-hand shot and playing left wing, but to compensate, I, I had to turn my head all the way around to the right to pick the puck and pick the play up and look over my right shoulder. Wow. And I, and consequently, I was overskating the puck and missing the net. And I just said, Willie, forget about what you can't see and concentrate on what you can see. So the season ends, and uh, I go back to my hometown, and I kept mm -hmm. my fingers crossed that I'd be contacted by a professional team. And uh, I waited and waited, and finally, I got a call from Punch Emlek, who was the coach and general manager of the Quebec Aces, the Quebec uh, professional team up in Quebec City. So to make a long story short, I go to training camp, I make the team. I don't tell them that I'm blind. I don't have a, an eye exam. So I says, well, <laughs> if I don't take an eye exam, just, just play. And we won the championship that year. So that's what gave me the extra confidence that I needed. I said, <laughs> I said, oh, man. I mean, that's, yeah. If, 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 if anything qualifies somebody to be a legend, I, I think that, that, that story makes it. Uh, um, let's talk about the sport itself. You know, you talked about back then what it was like being in, in the league as the first and only black player. You, you had teammates who supported you. You had fans who cheered for you. But there were also the fans who really could only think of the color of your skin as the reason that they didn't like you. You know, they were, they were, they were shouting slurs at you on the ice or they were shouting slurs at you from, from the stands. I'd love to know how you blocked out that noise. You know, I mean, that surely affects you as a human being, but you found a way to persevere. Was, was that something you had just grown up with in your family, or did you put your head down and, like, how did you do that? Well, I just put my head down. I was called the N-word uh, every time I stepped on the ice by players on the opposition, by fans in the stands. If I had a penalty and I went in the penalty box, I could hear them saying the N-word, but I just blocked it out. It, thanks to my older brother, again, and he told me, Willie, if they can't accept you for the individual that you are, because you have the skills and the ability to play in the league at this particular time, he said, forget about everything else. He said, just go out, stay focused on your goal, and work hard. And basically, that's what I did. But, I mean, I, it, it, was, it was really rough at, at, the, at the beginning, Trevor. It, it really was. But finally, I gained the respect the, of the players and the, and the, and the fans. 
Man, I, can, I, I honestly can't even imagine how hard it must have been, you know, being in that world. Um, there, there are over 100 black players, you know, who have now played in the NHL. Many of them yeah. have either talked about your story or they've talked about your journey in some way inspiring them. But they've also talked about how difficult it can be being the only black player on a team, you know, the only black player who's representing a, a, a franchise. You know, were there any tips that you gave to any of these players or were there any tips that you learned that would help you not almost carry the entire burden of being the only black player on a team? You know, being able to fail for Willie or being able to succeed for Willie and not always worrying that it, you know, it, it represents all of blackness at the same time, which it did and didn't. Well, I met a lot of the black players and the players of color that are playing in the, in the league at the present time. And, you know, some of them that, that I have met, they said, Willie, I just can't imagine what you had to go through to make it possible for players like me to play in the league. He says, I just, I have the highest respect and the highest admiration for you. He said, what you, what you had to do, you must have had to turn your cheek a thousand times. And I said, I just stayed, I stayed focused on what I wanted to do. I, I worked hard and I, I told myself I'm good enough to play in the league and uh, just, just work hard and uh, stay confident. Let's talk a little bit about the future. You know, you, we're celebrating you and you've been celebrated for such a long time as being not just part of black history, but part of also the NHL's history. You have now been an ambassador for the uh, National Hockey League, getting black players into it, players of color. You know, kids who would have never thought that this could be their sport or maybe they wanted to get into it, but couldn't. It's an expensive sport to get into you. You know, your skates and, and, and all the equipment that you need to, to be part of, it sometimes becomes a bigger barrier than even the color of your skin. When you're, when you're meeting with new kids and you, you're talking to these children who want to join in, how do you inspire them to get into a sport that sometimes might be just out of their reach? Well, we have, uh, we have uh, organized programs all over North America. And uh, when I first started, uh, there were approximately five. We have about 36 now. And, and before the pandemic, I was traveling around to these cities and uh, uh, talking to the uh, elementary schools, middle schools, junior high, high schools, um, Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, YMYWCAs, Juvenile Detention Facilities, to let them know that there is a sport that they can play if they want to. And uh, all you have to do is come to the rink and uh, we'll, we'll learn you how to skate. And uh, if, you, if you follow, we'll get you on an organized, an organized team where you're able to, uh, able to play. I mean, uh, hockey's a fun sport, and I, but I tell these kids, if you're not having fun, don't play it. Uh, find another sport. <laughs> but uh, I, can, I can honestly say that um, the clinics that I've conducted over the years, once I get these boys and girls on the ice, I've not had one boy or girl come up and say, oh, Mr. Ree, I, I don't like wow. this. I'm not coming back. So it, it's a nice feeling to reach out and, even, and just touch one individual and make a difference in their life. Well, that's why you are who you are. That's why you are receiving not just the medal, but uh, all the praise, and we celebrate you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Willie O'Ree. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for what you've done, and uh, thank you for the joy that you've brought to the sport and to the world. We appreciate you.